Essex is a fantastic county. More and more people are wanting to come and live and work here. And it's easy to see why. Essex is growing and with growth comes responsibility because we all want a future Essex to retain its vibrancy, its resilience, its prosperity, and all those things that make it a great place. But it's not just about retaining those things, it's about improving them, because there's a few challenges that are starting to get in the way. Let's start with one of the most pressing. The climate crisis is already upon us. The key thing is whether we can make the changes to our economies in time to make sure that the effects are not completely serious. In Essex, we've already seen changes to extremes of weather, floods and drought, and a slow rising of the sea levels along our long coastline. We will see in the coming couple of decades uh, a substantial increase in the sea level um, as the big ice sheets of the Antarctic and, and Greenland begin to melt. The target really for the kinds of changes that we need to make, reducing our emissions of carbon to zero as quickly as possible, need to happen over the next 20 to 30 years. It's what we call net zero. At least 80% of the reduction has to come from cutting carbon emissions. And maybe the remaining 10 or 20% can come from carbon capture in healthier soils, in forests, in woodlands, in nature, and other things that can hold on to our carbon. So this is the critical period, uh, this next 20 years, um, to hold temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees above the historic background. We're at 1.2 at the moment, and it's still increasing. So the need for action is urgent, um, and one of the big areas for that for the change is going to be on housing and infrastructure. We're going to need to make changes to almost every aspect of our ways of living, our food, our transport, our housing, our energy. Green infrastructure is going to be a critical part of our future. The, the way that we our housing is built and the way we live, the way that buildings are created, the way that old ones are renovated, the infrastructure that supports them, all of these are going to need changes and it is an exciting opportunity really to reduce the amount of carbon, reduce the costs for householders as well as businesses um, and create um, more healthy communities uh, for the whole of Essex. So climate change isn't a done deal. We can still do things to minimise its impact, even halt it. And we need to because everyone will suffer if we don't. More people are coming to live in Essex than ever before. This also means more people are being born in Essex and people are living longer. It's estimated that by 2036, the county's population will be around 2.1 million. That's over 200,000 more people living in Essex than there were in 2016. And they'll all need a house to live in, 180,000 of them to be precise. 180,000 new homes that will need to be built along with expanded and new infrastructure development. And without proper measures, all this puts at risk one of Essex's richest and most valuable assets, our biodiversity. Coastal salt marshes, mudflats, ancient woodlands and wetlands provide rare and valuable habitats for species that are vital for our well-being even our very existence. The Romans understood this 2,000 years ago when they began to extract salt from the Essex coastline. They managed their operations to minimise their impact on the very resource upon which their lives were dependent. They knew not to bite the hand that feeds them. We have to do the same today. The Essex Green Infrastructure Principles and Standards are a set of measures that will help Essex to develop its economy in harmony with the natural world. They've been established on the foundation of two key recommendations set out by the Essex Climate Action Commission. One, that 30% of all land in Essex will enhance biodiversity and the natural environment by creating natural green infrastructure. And two, 
increase urban greening of our towns, villages and new developments by 30% by 2040. Properly implemented, the benefits of these principles and standards go beyond environmental protection. Two-thirds of adults in Essex are overweight and 40% of people fail to get the recommended amount of physical exercise. This puts pressure on health services and impacts productivity. Today, there's ever-growing evidence of the positive impact that green space has on people's health. Whether it's a stroll in the woods or jog in the park, immersing oneself into the natural world can be invigorating and energising. And it's not just physical health either. Nature, countryside, green space, all helps to improve people's mental health and well-being. Practices such as ecotherapy and forest bathing are rapidly becoming mainstream in their ability to bring calmness, peacefulness and tranquility to people's lives. But these opportunities for people to improve their physical and mental well-being is dependent upon them having access to green space. For this reason, we need to preserve the spaces for those things to happen and increase accessibility to them. So Essex Green Infrastructure Principles and Standards helps to deliver on wider environmental, social and economic policies and priorities. By embracing green infrastructure, we can increase connectivity to trees and nature. We can reverse the decline in our biodiversity and contribute to place making and place keeping creating livable neighbourhoods. Green infrastructure has brilliant multifunctional benefits for people and the planet, and Essex. In this video, you'll learn about what the principles and standards are, how to apply them, and see the benefits where they're already in use. Ready? Let's get going, because there's not a moment to lose. Green infrastructure is a network of planned and natural assets that provides the ingredients for solving social, economic and climatic challenges by building with nature, not against it. It reinforces the symbiotic relationship that exists between the urban and natural worlds. But what do we mean by green infrastructure assets? Well, broadly speaking, there's a set of eight primary asset groups. First, there's natural and semi-natural assets. This includes things like woodlands, hedgerows, heathland and disused quarries. Next, there's what we call blue infrastructure. Assets such as reservoirs, ponds, lakes, rivers and watercourses. Essex has a wonderful coastline and the assets related to this fall under the group coastal features. Beaches, dunes, foreshores, intertidal areas and so on. Then there's urban assets, managed green spaces such as graveyards, allotments and playing fields. Greenway assets include public rights of way, cycle paths and bridleways. And there's three more examples that are classified as assets in their own right. Country parks, verges and ancient woodland. All of these assets are not just nice to look at or exist merely as part of our natural heritage, although both of these are reason alone to preserve them, but are vital to the economy and our lives. They minimise the effect of surface flooding. They contribute to climate adaption, such as minimising urban heat islands. They absorb CO2, helping to mitigate climate change. They provide habitats for pollinating insects and birds increasing biodiversity. They help keep agricultural soil fertile and enable greater moisture retention, making our farmland more resilient to drought. And they give people the opportunity for exercise and an escape from the pressures of everyday life. People's sense of well-being increases, crime can reduce, health can increase and life becomes better for everyone. Sounds great, but how do we transition this knowledge into tangible action. Well, that's where the Essex Green Infrastructure Principles and Standards comes in. The Essex Green Infrastructure Principles and Standards provides a framework against which development professionals, 
and all those responsible for placemaking and placekeeping can refer to when considering the impact that developments may have on the natural environment. They're intended to help inform decisions and shape design. They're not policies in themselves, but they will help development professionals adhere to relevant legislation that exists now and those scheduled for introduction later. The Biodiversity Net Gain legislation, for example, which comes into force in late 23, will require, by law, the planning authorities to contribute to the recovery of nature when developing land. To tell us more, here's Councillor Peter Schwer, Essex County Council's Climate Czar. A high quality environment is one of the four strategic aims in everyone's Essex, our plan for levelling up the county. We have committed to reduce the county's greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 and make Essex more resilient to climate impacts such as flooding, water shortages and overheating. The environmental arguments for doing this are compelling. So too are the social and economic ones. Parks and green spaces in England deliver an estimated 6.6 .6 billion of health, climate change and environmental benefits every year. But with 80% of people now living in towns and cities, one third of people do not have access to good quality green and blue space within 15 minutes of their home. The Essex Green infrastructure principles and standards exist as key pillars in our strategic aims to make Essex more resilient and more prosperous for all. There's nine in total, all interconnected with one another. The first principle, and arguably the most pressing, is mainstreaming and integration. We want green infrastructure to feature with not just local thinking, but local plans, actual tangible evidence of the institutional recognition of the significance it has on achieving sustainability, environmental protection, creating nice places to live, work and visit. This means inclusion in those strategic documents that are used to drive planning, master plannings, design and access statements, environmental impact assessments, garden communities and village proposals and the like. You'll find a full list of documents in the technical guidance on page 14, which you can access from the link below. This also means that when those documents undergo scrutiny, it's clear that it's integrated into what we want to do. Chelmsford has done just that. Chelmsford is growing fast. Its population growth rate is nearly 1% above the national average and shows no signs of slowing. Thousands of new homes continue to be built across the city. Even a new rail station is being constructed. In 2018, Chelmsford City Council launched its Green Infrastructure Strategic Plan. This sets out the need to integrate green infrastructure within the planning and development that's supporting the city's growth. Using evidence-based insight, it enables the mainstreaming of green infrastructure in development planning at the very start of the process. It defines the aspirations and objectives of the city in terms of delivering benefits to residents, the workforce and visitors as being a nice place to be and ensuring this philosophy and approach remains as the city continues to grow and evolve. We're already starting to see tangible examples of this. The city has an excellent network of cycle paths. Green corridors exist and river valleys are well treed. All aspects of green infrastructure are now embedded into the City Council's policies for managing assets like grasslands, wildlife sites and verges. This means that as the city continues to grow, it does so in harmony with nature, creating not just nice homes, but nice places to live and work. We're embracing the same approach at county level. The Essex Design Guide seeks to establish a more positive perception of development. It exists for developers, town planners and urban designers as a means to deliver best practice. It looks beyond the architecture and prioritises the creation of distinctive places that people want to live in. 
building communities and improving lives. Green infrastructure is a vital component in delivering vision and is ingrained within the guide. It also supports engagement with a wider user group, communities, politicians and the media. This is an important aspect of another of the green infrastructure standards, early collaboration and engagement, which I'll come back to in a moment. The second principle is that the planning and implementation of green infrastructure must be evidence-led, using proper environmental assessment and mapping. It cannot be theoretical or abstract. The third principle is multifunctionality. This can be an elusive concept, but is vital when considering green infrastructure interventions. There is need to undertake systematic spatial assessment of all urban green and blue spaces and their social, ecological and economic functions. And take into account that not all sites must or can deliver the same set of functions. I mentioned early engagement and collaboration a moment ago. This is the fourth principle. Green infrastructure impacts many stakeholders, planning, finance, businesses, communities and so on. They all need to be brought into the process of evolving ideas early on. This is key to creating the delivery of a properly integrated and effective green infrastructure. A little further east from Chelmsford is Malden, a town that's been dependent on its green infrastructure for thousands of years. When it developed its district design guide, this approach to early stakeholder engagement proved vital. Malden is a town that has long been dependent upon the natural world, whether for salt production, farming, or the import and export of produce. The coast, inland waterways, farmland, and woodlands have been vital in its continued prosperity. Today, it's a town also undergoing tremendous growth, as demand for affordable housing is driving interest from people living in London's suburbs as they seek a new life further east. Back in 2012, Malden District Council began to work in consultation with developers and stakeholders in the preparation of their garden suburb master plans, part of their local development plan, which began to codify green space for development. And following that, in 2017, Malden District Council published its district design guide. Together, these documents shaped the garden suburbs principles in terms of green infrastructure, creating greenways, public open spaces, safe off-road walking and cycling routes, placing green infrastructure as the lead structural element to developments. Evidence of this can be seen here in the Limebrook Way development, and also here, a little further north, near Haybridge. A great example of the link between urban design and master planning and the importance of early stakeholder engagement to deliver brilliant green infrastructure that meets and aligns with the needs of local people. Next is the need to manage different expectations amongst different stakeholders and recognise that green infrastructure cannot be homogenous. Health, well-being and social equity is the sixth principle. As you heard a moment ago, Green infrastructure benefits public health as much as it does the environment. This means that it needs to be accessible by all and exclude no one. The seventh principle is about creating an increased connectivity using green infrastructure to create green corridors, which are exactly as it sounds. Imagine a new town development at one end is a park and at the other end open countryside and pathway that connects them both. And now imagine that instead of just paving slabs and tarmac, that pathway is lined with trees and shrubs and grass verges, creating in connectivity for people and nature. The eighth principle is a commitment to delivery. This requires strong policy wording, ensuring green infrastructure is required within a development and that it doesn't become a footnote or an annex. And finally, we must recognise that green infrastructure is permanent. So, 
The final principle is to ensure there is stewardship and maintenance in place to deliver and protect green assets in the long term. Essex is not doing this alone. The principles and standards we've set align with those at a national level. The government's 25-year environment plan was partly implemented by the Environment Act of 2021 and includes a commitment to develop a national framework of green infrastructure. Essex Child, the Natural England National Green Infrastructure Standards Framework, with the aim of mainstreaming it into the Essex planning process. Working with Natural England, we ensured the Essex Green Infrastructure principles and standards align with those of Natural England, who have agreed for their logo to be included on the guidance to demonstrate their endorsement as part of the National Green Infrastructure Framework. We're also working in close partnership with as our supply chain partners, many of whom are already embracing and implementing sustainability. You may be thinking that green infrastructure is all about the big stuff, those multi-million pound developments. Whilst it's critical that those sorts of developments embrace green infrastructure, it applies equally to smaller projects as well. Let's take a look at two examples at both ends of the spectrum of scale. Just south of Chelmsford in West Hanningfield is Temple Farm. Once a sprawling scrapyard, this stunning 34-acre site is now the British headquarters of the Jehovah's Witness organisation. Comprising a campus complex, study centre, a distribution hub, even a film studio, it stands as one of the most pioneering developments built in the UK on all aspects of sustainability. Solar provides energy. Green roofs reduce heat flux and enhance biodiversity. Rainwater runoff is fed into rain gardens. Access roads feature sustainable urban drainage systems, feeding water into ponds managed to enhance wildlife. Biodiversity net gain was achieved through the planting of trees and native hedgerows. Pedestrian and cycle routes take into account accessibility and inclusivity for all users and visitors. And by incorporating green infrastructure thinking early on, enabled the design to accommodate efficiencies in long-term maintenance. A great example of multifunctionality in green infrastructure, from initial concept, design, through to landscape design, build and onward management. Further south, we find the rain gardens situated within the grounds of Basildon Hospital. This little oasis provides staff, patients and visitors a tranquil space to rest and relax and have even been shown to improve recovery rates. The hospital is located in a critical drainage area, one of the most at risk locations in the UK from pluvial flooding, with the site of the garden being an area most prone to this. A sustainable drainage system helps to address this risk. Green infrastructure was embraced through the process with fauna and flora providing a habitat for bees and butterflies and a nice place for a nurse to grab a lunchtime sandwich or a patient to spend a little time to relax and recuperate. As I mentioned earlier on, these principles and standards are not policies or directives. You could say they're a philosophy, a way of thinking that shapes how we all see a future Essex and how that future can be realised. So implementing them really comes down to understanding them and embracing them. It does require a change in thinking and approach. And yes, change can sometimes be daunting. But consider this, there was a time when there was no planning legislation. The Industrial Revolution created the need for housing on a massive scale, often within small areas. This led to the creation of poor quality, quickly built, cramped and unplanned towns and cities, resulting in terrible consequences for the health and well-being of the resident populations, as well as extensive environmental pollution. But we learnt. We changed. And in 1909, the first planning legislation was introduced. 
A little more recently, there were times when planning and development didn't pay much attention to health and safety. Little thought was given to things like sight lines at road junctions or the safety of pedestrians. Few thought to scrutinise the safety of materials like asbestos. But that changed too. And today, these are things that are ingrained in the most fundamental of developments. It's one of the first questions that gets asked. Is this safe? So, change is necessary. Change is good. It allows us to evolve as a society, as the world evolves around us. So, alongside the questions of things like safety, we want to ask, is it sustainable? Is it contributing to biodiversity? Will it help improve people's health? Is it going to help make Essex resilient to climate change? There's a simple six-step approach drawn from the National Green Infrastructure Framework. Firstly, really understand green infrastructure. There's a lot of resources available, so use it. Understand the requirements, research good practice, and develop a strong commitment to it. Engage with stakeholders early and often. Understand their needs, their wants, and how they can all play an active role in delivering green infrastructure. Include green infrastructure in pre-application discussions. Make sure those wanting to develop something know what the expectations are. Carefully assess the quality of green infrastructure considerations and measures within applications. Include green infrastructure in planning negotiations. And finally, always keep in mind that green infrastructure is not momentary, it's permanent. So always consider the long-term stewardship of the measures being proposed. Here's Rich Cook, Principal Spatial Planner at Essex County Council. So, as people are aware, at this point in time, lots of new changes have been introduced into the planning process. And that includes things like changes to national planning policy, changes broader, wider changes to the overall planning system uh, through planning reforms, as well as things like biodiversity net gain requirements and a responsibility now to develop local nature recovery strategies as well. It's really important that all those things are not seen in isolation. They're strongly interlinked. And with that in mind, the green infrastructure principles and standards have been developed to help people to take action in the planning system across all those different fronts. So I see the role of this guidance as promoting consistent good practice across planning, across Essex to deliver better overall outcomes. So that includes helping the developers and planning applicants to design and refine better developments, to also help local authorities to assess those proposals and to shape and steer them where that proves necessary as well. Hopefully the net result then is securing and developing the right kinds of homes, decent homes that people need, quality workspaces to provide jobs and to grow the economy and all of those things sat together in high quality green infrastructure. So the guidance is there and in place now to help all of us in planning to help to take concerted action across all those fronts and hopefully deliver the right kinds of outcomes and results that we all need. You can find out more in the Essex Green Infrastructure Standards Technical Guidance from the link below and at essex.gov.uk, search for green infrastructure. I'll leave you with a parting word from Professor Jules Pretty. As development professionals involved in planning and building and implementation of the places that we live, this is a fantastic opportunity to do new things, to play a significant leadership role in creating low carbon futures that will have lower costs for us all, businesses, public sector, householders, that will be healthier and that will be better for nature as well.